My first job, I was 11 years old. I lived on the farm in the country of New Elm, Texas, and my first job was picking cotton on Walter Hancock's farm. We were sharecropping, and whatever we picked, we had to divide it with the sharecropper, which I didn't quite understand. He wasn't out in that hot sun picking cotton. I was. Why should I give him part of mine? But we did. But my dad explained later why that, it, that we had to share because it was sharecropping. We had to use his equipment because we didn't have anything to use. So that's what happened. I was about 15 and I was in my sophomore year of high school. It was a lifeguarding position, which was kind of cool. It was a summer job. I think it only lasted maybe four months. Mm -hmm five months tops. Mm -hmm. uh, it was pretty cool, but I'm not gonna lie, it was kind of difficult because you deal with all types of people with lifeguarding and you dealt with a lot of like crazy moms in community pools and stuff. There was a couple kids that fake drowned, so that was stressful. <laughs> but otherwise it was good, you know, you were always out in the sun, I got a really awesome tan. You know, you got to interact with a lot of cool people. My first job was working at a drugstore. I was remember I was nine years old in the fifth grade. I was delivery boy, delivering uh, medicine stuff. I was a road rode a bicycle, and it was doing the neighborhood, you know, neighborhood uh, drugstore. I was making twenty five cents an hour, and uh, and a uh, boss. I mean, the one or the pharmacy. He gave us change, like the stuff was like three dollars. He gave you two two dollars or five dollars. He, he asked the people to need like it's ninety, I mean seventy five cents. He give you a quarter and four ones. You know, you know that way you had change. You know. It was uh, uh, named Cloudy Pharmacist on the corner of the Pine and Highway. Well, my first job was at Dunkin' Donut. It was in 1981, and it was good. It was an interesting job. I had to work seven days a week, making donuts, delivering the donuts. I loved it because the money was coming, so I didn't mind it. It was good, like so much work, taking care of the customer, making donuts, taking care of the employees, and all kind of stuff. So it was good. The pay was good. It was awesome. So it was a good job. My first job was a nurse's aide at San Antonio Convalescent Center at 921 Nolan in 1963. I was 23. I was working for an attorney during the summer uh, and his office uh, was at San Antonio Savings. Uh, and uh, my biggest moment was when I first saw uh, Mayor McAllister come in with his entourage and I was just uh, in awe about seeing him come in. Of course, the more I worked with the attorney, uh, I would see the mayor come in and out, so I got adjusted to that, but it was really awesome, uh, really exciting ex uh, experience for me to actually see the mayor up and close. And thank you for coming on, logging on to Urban 15's Hidden History, our uh, e-magazine, which we do on a monthly basis as part of the most recent 300-year anniversary of the 10,000 years we've lived here in this wonderful river valley. So uh, th congratulations. Uh, everybody had their first job. I think mine was as a, mine was as a bus boy at the Four Brothers Steakhouse right there uh, on, uh, ooh, on Brooklyn Street. Uh, between my freshman and sophomore summer year. Uh, everybody has a, a good and a bad memory of their first jobs. And uh, uh, I want to thank all the people who have participated in these last few weeks who are just offering up the little part of their life 
about their first jobs. We have a, a tribute tonight. Tonight's a, a, today's Labor Day, and uh, we thought we'd, we would just honor an honest day's work and feature a couple of things about how p people have used their time, used their hands, their minds, their intelligence, and sometimes got compensated uh, for a, a job well done and got well compensated, and other times we didn't. But uh, knowing that you do a good job is, is part of, of, of the human experience. And being part of a team or being by yourself, uh, these are, you know, you, you put your honest work into a project and, and that's the satisfaction that you get. Uh, I think that anger comes up when you feel exploited and when you don't feel appreciated for what you've done. And I want to salute all the people who've been out there, particularly today in this kind of weather, who are working to make this city what it is out there. Uh, thank you very much for all of your time and your work. Uh, working cement, working labor, working the trades, even working in a sweatshop like a, a call center uh, in the air condition, but it's very stressful and hard work. So uh, it, it makes our city uh, come together, and tonight is in honor of you. Uh, we've always pursued the concept of found footage in the in the hidden histories, and tonight we're going to show some uh, found footage that we got uh, at the National uh, uh, Archives and Research Agency in Washington D.C. And it's footage of the high school to students who were used to reconstruct La Villita in 1938. And mostly students from Maine High School, Sydney Lanier High School. And uh, they were being taught stoneworking, metal smithing, forging, tile working, fabric. And much of the work that was done by high school students is what La Villita is today. And we thought we'd pay honor to them with this little segment. It's about 11 minutes and I'm gonna talk over it a bit. Most of this footage was shot between October and December of 1938. There was a WPA uh, photographer, a 16 millimeter cameraman who came down. Uh, we cannot find his name, but he was shooting color. Uh, the color, if you notice, is, it's very oversaturated with age. Uh, when we found the film, it was still in 16 millimeter format. And we projected it and shot it with beta camera because that's what was free at the time at the archives. Uh, but you can see that much of the imagery, the iconography, the stencil work, the tile work, you can go back there to La Villita today and see exactly where she was standing and, and, and putting her work into play. Uh, this stained glass window making uh, was one of the art forms that was being taught. And it's so ironic that what we see today in our come to San Antonio tourism world are the buildings and the structures that were recovered and restored because of the WPA. La Villita, Sunken Gardens, the Arneson, uh, all of the missions. Uh, many of the uh, archers and stuff along the, the river walk, uh, the river walk itself, this was all money that was, the labor was provided by the WPA. And at that time, so many of Texas businessmen in particular thought of uh, Roosevelt as a communist and uh, uh, leftist because he was creating jobs for people who needed jobs. And the irony is today that the grandchildren of those people who fought with Roosevelt about work projects, they own most of the river walk and take advantage of the things that were being made by that period of time. Uh, the women here are, are uh, sewing. Uh, much of the leather craft and upholstery work was being taught.
I know many, many people in San Antonio whose parents or grandparents were part of the CCC or the WPA. Uh, both of my parents were involved. Is that, that's a loom. Wow, that's... My dad was CCC and he was planting trees in Utah, Wyoming, and Wyoming uh, because of the, there had been terrible floods and, and the landslides had left the mountains uh, pretty barren. And they had thousands of guys digging holes and, and putting trees in the ground. And uh, when you land at the uh, Salt Lake City Airport, which I did with him one time, he pointed out the ridges where he remembers climbing and, and planting trees. Clay work. You probably walked on those very tiles, all the Saltillo tiles in, uh, I guess it's Plaza Juarez. WPA there, USA. It's amazing that these young men were being taught to do these jobs. This is pre-OSHA days. They're not wearing gloves, any, any protective gear at all. Yet they're digging, doing some very heavy work. See the Tower of Life out there in the back. I've seen pictures of Mission San Jose prior to the WPA where there was no roof on the building and the entire vestibule was exposed. And with WPA money, they were able to do the, the vaulted ceilings again. Boy, that's hard work. Much of the Alamo's outer walls that we currently see today were WPA uh, labor, the restoration of those walls.
This is fascinating to me. Uh, Laddie Reitz, a, a guy that I went to high school with, uh, was telling me that his father did blacksmithing. He learned blacksmithing there at La Vita during the WPA. And uh, uh, all of those hinges and sliding latches and many of the uh, ways that the flower vases are hung and the lights, uh, those were all done in the forges there they created on the property. What you just saw was 11 minutes of a 38 minute uh, segment that we found in National Archives and I'm sure that there's much, much more about San Antonio uh, that we might be able to bring to you on another show. Uh, to me, it's always exciting to find something like that uh, because that's what hidden is, history is all about. Now tonight we do have a very special guest though and uh, it is a, uh, an honor to be with uh, Miss Ann Lewis tonight. She's a well-known documentary filmmaker and her heart is always in the right place no matter what she's done in her life. So Ann, thank you for coming, <laughs> coming to uh, Hidden Histories. Uh, uh, Ann teaches at the University of Texas in Austin and we're very lucky to have her here after a long career working with uh, nonprofits and filmmaking organizations throughout Kentucky, Tennessee, and the rest of the nation. She lived 15 years in Kentucky and was a uh, did a, a long body of work concerning environmental, labor, health, uh, the big concerns that we have here in San Antonio as well uh, in that neighborhood. So, Ann, thank you for coming with us. This, this has been an adventure to do uh, Hidden Histories, and uh, to some of us here, not very hidden, but, we, we, uh, but the rest of the world will we'll do our best to, to bring you to uh, your work to the surface. Uh, one of the things that you do is you make documentaries. You don't make action films. Uh, can you can well, you give her <laughs> action sometimes? You know? <laughs> so so what makes a doc a doc? Oh boy. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, uh, you know, there's there's the kind of academic definition of it, which I don't really go for. <laughs> um, I think a documentary uh, always has uh, the subjective in it, and that's what people sometimes don't realize. It's closer to an essay or an opinion and an argument than it is to a nonfiction piece. So documentary is a part of nonfiction, but I think um, it always has, <coughs> has um, the subjective and more modern documentaries are, tend to be quite transparent. I mean, you'll hear the questions asked. You'll see the context of something. Just as you just gave context for the archival here, I think more and more people are giving context, not just plopping visuals in to cover cuts in an interview, but trying to understand what the actual shot is or what the material is. So it's a, it's a transformative kind of um, art form that everybody has different definitions for. I tend to be very wide open in my definition. I like all kinds of different documentaries, um, but I don't think I've ever liked anything that was purely factual because I'd rather read a book. <laughs> I can put it down, you know? <laughs> Um, so that's, that's kind of um, the basis of it, I think. Now the history of film itself, all of those early films, the very first film was about a uh, Venus. Mm -hmm. uh, it was done, uh, what, 1874, something yeah. like that. But usually documentaries are about, or they depict, or they capture, or they document something in time. So is a photograph, every time we take it, a picture, and that's just a moment of time, so are all photographs, you might say, documentaries in themselves? Well, there has to be some motion involved, right? Oh. For it to be a film. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, there have been, I don't think there's ever been a documentary made exclusively of still, maybe Ken Burns. No, he has interviews, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, but I think, you know, usually, um, Film is, is stills in motion, so I don't think that still photographs are 
There's certainly documents, um, but are they documentaries? I mean, it becomes semantic, you know. Um, but yeah, it's a, it's a wonderful form. It came in very early. I mean, you know, um, uh, the, the, things like Porter's films were documentary, um, you know, the, or had documentary, sometimes they were mixed. Like there's one about firemen coming to save a woman and the woman is completely staged, but you're seeing the real fire truck coming to the rescue. So, you know, it, it wasn't, it was not as separated out. And there's also a very strong uh, experimental tradition within documentary, um, beginning with Vertov. Yeah. So, so it's, a, you know, it's a wide open, wonderful form that people can do all kinds of things in, with. And so many of those anthologies, say 1904 to 1910, they're just almost existential statements like walking and <laughs> people walking. Right. Another one, you know, the dog. And it's a, it's a series of, of right. short clips of dogs and, and they almost give them personalities with the, with the way right. they shoot them. Did you ever see The Damn Family? No, no, tell uh, me about it. It's The Damn Family. It's, you know, it's felt like they were cursed or something, but um, it's a series of um, pieces of a family and it, you know, this is the damn wife and the damn husband and the damn dog and so forth. And it can you, be that silly. It's, it's like, that's Porter, I think, but it's probably a real family. So I suppose it's a documentary of some sort. Now, the, it was probably during the, the 20s and 30s where uh, social justice issues and, and, mm -hmm. and social conditions uh, with the crash of 29 particularly, uh, people got very, very uh, politicized with their abilities to uh, uh, use the camera. Right. And uh, other people used it as a way to glorify. And one of the first documentaries I can recall was The Plow That Broke the Plane. Right. And, uh, uh, and that was a pretty powerful piece, but that was a major, almost epic. Right. Um, well, the British also come in you know, doing very realistic films about the working class. Um, the first films, I think really the first documentary, although people would say Nanook of the North, right, is supposed to be the first documentary, but I think Vertov has to be looked at. And he came, he was the cameraman during the Russian Revolution and came straight out of that tradition and was doing very modern stuff right from the beginning, handheld camera, uh, he, one of the first uh, films he ever did was about um, very drunken women dancing in a Russian village um, and getting drunker and drunker and kissing every guy around. And, I mean, it's fantastic stuff. It's the first um, music video ever, probably. Um, but so there's, there's that stuff. And then, then with the Depression, you begin seeing the American ones, which is Plow That Broke the Plane and so forth. And those are. Those are wonderful, wonderful films, beautifully photographed, orchestras playing, you know, with Copeland or something like that. Um, and then, but they're essays, right? They're illustrated essays. They're very poetic. They're very in praise of common folk. Um, they're very, they certainly tell you something, but they're, they're kind of pieces of poetry. Um, and that all gets um, really broken with the coming of Cinema Verite, which is, which is the stuff that I come out of. Well, you know, with cable TV in particular, mm -hmm. you're able now through Netflix or through, through even through Prime or uh, various collections out there in, in Hulu, uh, you're able to find great, great repositories of documentary films. And I'm surprised when I'm talking to someone who is totally into action movies and all of a sudden mm -hmm. will tell me, I saw this thing last night, you know, it was a 1948 movie on, you know, the, right. you know, some kind of Contiki event or something, uh, or Indians and, or something. And, and the fact that documentary is becoming part of our, it's becoming more accessible. You don't have to go to the public library and get a 16 millimeter film out from the, from the shelves or, you can get it right now on screen. Is, are you seeing a rise of interest in documentary watching? Absolutely. Oh, yeah. I mean, I used to, because I teach editing, um, 
I used to ask, and, and I teach a documentary section of editing, which is the hardest editing, is doc editing. Um, no script, you know, you have to create the story. So um, I used to go around my class, which would be about 20 people, and ask them to name a documentary. And we're talking 15 years ago. I never could get around the class and have everybody name a documentary. Now I can. Um, you know, uh, fairly standardly, I get all the way around the class. Getting around it again might be a question. I mean, it's not like it's intensely popular, but I think there have been a number of people who have popularized it a great deal. Um, Michael Moore be among them. I mean, this is Labor Day, and that was, Roger Me was probably one of the first modern real looks at working people and what was, what was happening to them in Flint. Well, it seems so that you are, an observer and an eyewitness to act, something that's happening in, in reality. Uh, and that changes the responsibility from creating an entertainment device to actually what is happening that you're in front of you and witnessing. And there seems to be a lot of morality, the choice, moral choices that you have to make as mm -hmm. a filmmaker. Absolutely. So what kind of people are drawn to do that kind of work? Um, curious people. <laughs> I, I mean, I certainly wasn't um, a particularly um, religious or moral person. Uh, oh, tell me about that. <laughs> that's a great, uh, that's another segment, folks. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> I mean, I think um, I'm interested in everything, nearly. There are a few things I'm not interested in, but very few. Most things I'm very interested in. And I think that's what it takes, in a way, to want to do this. Um, this is hard work, though. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's not as hard as coal mining. <laughs> which is I mean, a, I'm which, here which is pretty a, good house. I mean, that seems know? like a very good advertisement for the kind of some documentaries <laughs> you've done. We do have some clips. Uh, uh, yeah, we have one from Harlan County. From Harlan County. Can you so, just set uh, that up first? Yeah. Uh, well, Harlan County, let me tell you a story about Harlan County because, you know, people can Google everything these days. So, you know, it's not that big a deal. But the story that's not in the film is how we got to Harlan County. So the, the film began, um, it's a Barbara Koppel film. It's not my film. Um, but we're honoring workers today. So I was one of the workers on this film. Um, so was Barbara, of course. Um, there was a very small crew. Um, and I had um, moved to New York to learn something about filmmaking, ran into Barbara, we did a film together. And then she went down and documented a rank and file uprising in the mine workers against a, a very bad leadership in the mine workers. And they won their election. And then we were back in New York and we were looking at all this footage and there wasn't a film there, which is a sad moment when you have that happen to you, you know? It just didn't, and then a call came in, and I was there when the call came, and it was, it was the Mine Workers Union, the new leadership. And they said, you've got to get down to Harlan County or there's going to be a killing there. And, you know, I was 22, 23 years old. Barbara was about my age, and, you know, we said, oh, yeah, <laughs> you know, we're going off. Well, none of us had ever been in eastern Kentucky before, and we'd been reading books that were really scary. And there was an article in the New Yorker by Calvin Trillin about the killing of a cameraman in the next county over. So that wasn't making us very happy. Um, so Barbara had an old boyfriend who had ran a sock store in Knoxville, a hippie sock store. And so she said, you know, he can help us you know, understand the culture. So we get on an airplane, we fly in, and we got lost getting there. And we're like, we don't know where we are. And Barbara says, well, let's just go to the picket line. We drive, we're in the night, it's the mountains, we don't know, we pull up to the picket line, and it's like six in the morning by this point. I think our plane got in at 11. <laughs> so there we are. And we pull up, and there's a scene laid out in front of us, which I will never forget. So there are these state troopers. There's the mine. There's these state troopers. And then um, 
I'm sorry, I'm going to turn it around. Mine, state troopers, highway, women with clubs, fierce looking women too, um, railroad tracks, and then miners standing slightly above with rocks in their hands. And what's going on is every time that a train goes by, they throw rocks at the state troopers, right, over the train. And, and we look at this thing, and the guy who owned the sock store says, I'm not getting out of this car, <laughs> right? So we go back to town, we find a payphone, and we call, and we finally um, get a hold of an organizer, get him out of bed. <laughs> he comes down, takes us to the picket line, and within about 10 minutes, we were filming these pretty violent arrests with the police, with the state troopers, arresting minors. And, um, but my realization at that point, which is really uh, what the story is about and what, in the way the film is about, um, was that you really have to decide what side you're on. Um, it just, you know, for your own survival, if nothing else, you really need to figure out, are you going to be observing something? Are you going to, you know, tuck tail and run? Or are you going to um, participate with people that are involved in struggle? And, um, and I, I think very quickly we, we began identifying with the miners and we began documenting their story as much from their point of view as we possibly could. And really finding that that was our point of view. That's not to say you don't tell the truth, but you really are trying to get inside of what's going on with people in struggle. Well, if it's queued up, is, can, sure. can we, can and we this, watch? Oh, this scene is... Oh. Um, Okay, so the day before, they have, um, there's been a real attack on the picketers by the company, and they've shot at us. And so, and they beat up the camera crew. And I got a gun pointed in my face, and I got very righteous about it and went down and asked the, um, and filed a warrant on this guy who pulled the gun. And so that was used as leverage in this scene uh, against them. So okay. you'll see that. And you can see me in it as a 23-year-old. <laughs> Basil Collins, right? Well, what's it doing? And you know it's not neutral. It's not neutral. It, it's now, not neutral. Not you know what it car, is. Period. And I'll tell you, you know what I told you? I don't give a damn how much money you make in it that's been a sheriff, but don't go against the union. That's all I ask. And when you move that's that the car, only thing I ask. Baby, you can stand here and raise hell all you want to. This road's got to be clear. All right, will you go up there when they shoot machine guns across the highway? No, he yeah. won't. No, no. Will you go up there then? No, he no. won't. They know they they know no, he won't do it. Why don't you no, he won't. Then? You weren't up there well, yesterday. No, he won't. When they beat us in Clovis, when they beat that 17-year-old boy, he won't. I mean, well, I, I see it. Yeah, I, you yeah, know what, Billy? Gee, that was told to me, and I wouldn't believe it before the election. It was told to me that you did this. <laughs> it really was. We're not home. Mr. Williams, 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 Mr. Williams,
Cut your teeth with that. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, so that was um, an incredible experience, that whole film was. And um, kind of a, you know, I think it has been something that's been really an important film for, um, for a lot of different people in this country because it's one of the first that shows working people actually taking control over their lives. Um, you know, we see a lot of films that are very strong where people are victimized and exploited, but we don't see very many where people actually grab hold of things and, and begin making change themselves um, from the bottom up. So that was a very important film to watch people move in that way. Now, one of the things you said earlier was that you weren't really taking a stand, but your position was created by what you what was going on there, and you became on the side of the of, of the the coal miners. Uh, and earlier, you sent me a document, a little statement from uh, uh, Bill Moyers. Uh huh. Uh, and 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 I think I it. Can't remember okay. <laughs> it says some some documentaries you make, um, and others are given to you. Yeah, some you some you find. Some you find. Right. And that's kind of like the guiding philosophy of what we've been doing these, these last few episodes. We're finding things about San Antonio. Exactly. So we're moving into the next level of our conversation is you have found something in San Antonio that you feel unifies a greater body of work about Texas. And, right. Right. And this is the, the film in which you're going to be showing here on Friday night. And can you give us some ideas of the origins and why did you do it? Right. <laughs> okay, so it, it's not so much, I mean, it's, it's my first film about Texas. So the way I entered it um, was really as a way to kind of explore the strange place where I landed in um, 98. Um, so I land in Texas, uh, in Austin, coming out of a town of 1,500 people in Whitesburg, Kentucky, and a collective that I continued working with for a number of years, kind of long distance, um, but a, a really wonderful collective called Apple Shop. Um, so I had had a, um, a kind of a working um, cohort, um, and, and I really understood some things, I think, about Appalachia, and I knew darn well that I understood very little about Texas. Um, and it was hot and it was Austin. <laughs> it was really disorienting um, at first. So, uh, so I thought, well, you know, I do know something about labor and, um, and I am part of a labor union because I joined um, Texas State Employees Union very early on, so I had union brothers and sisters um, in that union. Um, and I'm still a member of Texas State Employees Union, part of CWA. So I, was, I could identify as a union person in this place where I knew very little else. Um, very strange environment 
even f the physical environment is very different, right? Um, so initially, I had a very good friend, Emily Jones, who, um, who taught high school here for a while. She was a math teacher here um, at one of the high schools. But she um, had written a paper about the Conchellor strike. And I looked at it, and I thought, this is, this is really interesting stuff. I mean, you know, the, to have a union uh, drive that resulted in a strike of 10,000 people, more or less, um, even in the 30s, which was a time of big strikes, um, but for them to also be in the South, um, Latina, um, very old, very young, disabled people, um, uh, a kind of a people's uprising um, led by a woman was just extraordinary. These were not the usual people that you would think of. I mean, even today, if you ask people to name what, what, what is a union person, you know, the, what is the image of a union person, it's probably going to be somebody in the trades or um, you know, a, a teamster or maybe a teacher these days. But, you know, it's changing. But to have that kind of workforce successfully organized and on top of it all win was a really interesting story, right? Um, with radical, this radical woman leading them, um, Emma Taniyuka, who's right back here. <laughs> So, you know, that was, that was fantastic kind of stuff to explore. Um, and uh, so I began exploring it. And the first thing that I did was um, I had met Laura Varela um, back um, very, maybe 10 years earlier, maybe a little less than that. She's not that old. But anyway, um, and I also knew Graciela. And so... Um, I began using people that I knew were part of San Antonio to lead me. And that's a pretty, you know, that's what filmmakers should do. I mean, you really shouldn't go invading other people's communities without, you know, without them. What we did in Harlan County was probably, you know, well, nobody else was there and we were called in by the union, so we had a good reason for being there. But, and I don't feel bad about being there, but. Uh, and we certainly formed, it's a question of alignment. You say that in my film, you know. It's always a question of alignment. So, but using local people is a way to really find out much more, you know, to work with you. Um, and I learned that um, pretty early on. So we began looking for, um, and Beva Sanchez Padilla was another person that was really somebody that I knew. Um, she came to um, Kentucky at one point, and we showed salt of the earth. Um, so, so we, um, and her film as well. Uh, so uh, there was this initial desire to find people who actually experienced the strike. Um, and we just began trying every way we could. Uh, we went for funding to the Texas Humanities Council, and, uh, you know, and this is, back in early 2000s, um, they apparently, there was somebody on their board that did not like the idea of them funding something about a communist, um, which Emma Tenayuka was. And so they were very reluctant to fund us very well, is my understanding. Um, but they did give us enough money to get going. And so we began, Laura and I went to, um, uh, senior centers on the west side. Um, Graciela, um, you know, came up with some people. Laura also came up with um, one of the people in the clips. And uh, should we show clips or? Sure. Can they, we do they, that? Yeah, they, Can we do that? We're going to do two excerpts right now from. Uh, the so film. these are. Um, let me just tell you a little yeah, bit set more. It up. Um, so one piece of the film is just letting people talk, letting people tell their stories. And um, the first woman is Sofia Gonzalez, and her son really is why we, through Laura, was how we got there. 
Um, and then the second is, is two of the people we found in the senior center, um, Hope Sanchez and Berta Amador. Um, uh, Sophia is still alive at 99 years old, all these years later. And um, her son came to a screening we had. And, um, but the other two women have had okay. passed. In that time, they were paying one pound a piece, four cents a pound. It wasn't dimes or quarters or anything. It was just pennies. All these pieces, you know, sometimes we get into a, our fingers, you know, and it hurts a lot. They're very good to eat, but they're very hard to peel. We didn't have any, any electricity, no, no radio, no telephone. Just a lamb. And a kerosene lamp. <laughs> Who tell us what was wrong with the wages? Nobody. They picked me for Treasure of the Union. Se pensaba cero cómo iba el, corriendo la huelga, cómo iba progresando eh, lo que Tanayuca estaba proponiendo. Y otra cosa, pues como todas vivían aquí en, casi en el barrio, pues word of mouth, you know, se decían va a haber esto y va a haber lo otro y vamos y vamos. La mayoría puras mujeres. Puras mujeres, casi las más mujeres, sí. Yo fui secretaria del comité número 3 de la huelga. <risa> que eso que no sabía ni, ni, ni qué poner, pero me electaron. Y, pues yo dije, sí, está bueno. <risa> pues mi papá no me dejaba ir, mi papá no me dejaba ir. <risa> ¿Pero que, qué apuntabas? ¿Quieres saber? Pues no apuntaba hace? nada porque nunca iba a la huelga. ¿Aún no ibas a las juntas? No, no iba a las juntas. Oh. <laughs> Pero era, era, era secretary. <laughs> so, um, so that's kind of where the, the film began, um, was um, with this kind of wonderful um, interviews with just people um, in San Antonio. Now, the film is a, a sort of a triptych, though. Yeah. yeah. So uh, can you explain how, how you brought these three diverse elements right. under one canopy? Well, one of the things that I, I tried to do in the film is, is have it be almost like an exploration of Texas. So we go to Comfort, Texas, which is really an interesting place. Um, and kind of out of the way on the way to San Antonio and look at the obelisk there. It's a monument to the um, Union on, um, on, it's the only one civilian monument. There are soldiers' monuments, but not civilian monuments on, on soil that was Confederate. So, you know, it's a, it's a very interesting story, and it's kind of my exploration of, of this, this turf, you know. Um, so one of the other things that Emily was involved in was a union, um, and, and this is my union story, um, a union organizing campaign that began um, as a um, race and gender discrimination lawsuit against Stephen F. Austin State University. Um, they weren't even paying people an hourly wage. <laughs> it was really something. Um, and we're talking 70s, you know. Um, it, it was really a plantation system. And the workers began mobilizing and organizing and demanding a union um, after this, this lawsuit just kept going on and on and on and on. And eventually there was a big march through town 
um, a Jobs with Justice March, and I um, couldn't show you a clip of that after another one, but um, there was this big march through town where they brought, the union brought like um, <clears throat> about 3,000 people into town. And they marched through Nacogdoches and the university basically decided it was time to, you know, de treat people a little bit better. So, so there was that story and I really wanted to tell it. And Emily, um, the woman that I mentioned earlier, was, was really involved in that one as a legal secretary. She, was, oh, she had become a lawyer by the end of it all. So it took that long and she worked her way through law school. But um, she described going, she had gone to Stephen F. Austin State University as a student and she got employment as a legal secretary for a man named Larry Daves, who, is, who spent a lot of time in San Antonio um, because he was um, Fuerza Unida's labor lawyer um, here in their, in their efforts against Levi. Um, so she, she um, uh, uh, was going through job applications and she discovered the N in equal opportunity was circled on all of the black applicants, <laughs> which was totally illegal, right? And so she discovers this, and you know, and and, and presents it as evidence to the judge, and you know, it it was very interesting. It's an interesting story. Um, again, a victory. Again, led um, primarily by African American women in this case. Um, again, people that ordinary people don't think of as being particularly union people or organizable, and uh, again, a victory. So there are a lot of relationships there, aside from the coincidental one, which was that I, these were the first two stories of labor that I heard in Texas. Now, the Confederate monuments. Um, uh, one of the things that I think is true about labor is that, particularly in this country, if you look at questions of labor, it's almost impossible to separate them from questions of community and questions of race. Um, it's all tied up together. I mean, you just can't talk about anything in this country, I don't think, without talking about race. Um, and so in both of these cases, these are kind of uprisings of people um, against a system that is exploiting them or oppressing them or both. And so the, for me, it all, you know, you can track it on back to, uh, you know, there's at least a little mention of Native Americans as well. Um, but you can track all of this back to a, a pretty brutal history that this country has um, in the way it treats uh, groups of people, particularly when it wants to exploit them or wants their land <laughs> or their labor. So there, these, this coming down of Confederate monuments for me is a kind of a sign of change, of positive change that um, that something is being done, that there's a new generation. And so that's the tie to that. You know, this whole 300 year history celebration in San Antonio uh, is kind of a Pandora's box <laughs> because all of a sudden you have a population at many, many levels of the population. And we're all curious about, okay, let's, let's think about those 300 years. And there've been several, arts projects in the community where people have been assigned, randomly assigned, a year to explore. Now those of us who explored those years, well, you know, we suddenly found things about those years that can never be taken out of our memory because we're now educated. Mm -hmm. I had the year 2007, I think Catherine's was 1728 or something and other artists had different years. But all these little boxes of information are now open. And it, it, there's going to be no way for anybody to actually push them back in, mm -hmm. and that's knowledge-based. So as a f documentary maker, 
when you open that box, how do you, how can you live without it becoming part of you, who you are? Right. Well, that's the whole point. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, that's why I make films is that you really do want people to have an experience with them that they wouldn't ordinarily have. I mean, you know, and maybe it's, I mean, one of the best things that I ever got when I was in Kentucky, I was making a lot of, I was doing quite a bit of cultural work as well as social issue work. And the best, best thing I ever got was when folks said, well, I'd really like to meet so-and-so that's in your film. Well, they had met that person in some kind of way, right? Or they'd met them in, in the way they processed their own experience. And so I think that these, these things that you open up um, change everybody uh, when you use them in a, in a medium, when you use media to explore these things. You know, it's not so, I don't know what you're doing. I, obviously, you're doing something in, in these hidden histories of, of, of taking a bigger hunk of it, right? But that idea of taking a year and really going deep in and trying to figure out what are people experiencing, um, if you then articulate it, I think that's really powerful and really important. Um, it's not that we're going to repeat the past, it's that we, we, we can transform somewhat by understanding the past because it is impacting us. You know, uh, I mean, a lot of what we are has been determined by the way we think of the past. Well, let's jump back to some clips because okay. the, this interesting uh, one that's coming up is uh, one of the few vo times that anybody in this room will have ever heard Emma's voice. Yeah, except for one fellow who's For those here. of us who know her. those of us who knew her. A few people here knew her. Uh, but, um, well, with yeah, that, one but of our, this is, one so of our, this is uh, a Catholic sister, the only Catholic sister that I ever met who had a boombox in her office. <laughs> <laughs> and one of the things I was really interested in was um, rather than using archival il as illustration, understanding what its context was and how it was created. And so she had, she became the archivist for Our Lady of the Lake University and she recently died, so it's very, you know, meaningful, I think, for folks from there. But, um, so, so we got her to play us this tape that she'd recorded. So that's what the clip is. And, okay, of, let, of let's Emma. hear I don't know if you get now, let me see. That was a song of the Robbins? It's a Marseillesa. I don't know if you get now, let me see. Si tu vives un mundo de penas, antes de esclavo, prefiero morir, prefiero morir. The music helps her to, to push there. Yeah, that's great. Wow. <laughs> How the French national anthem <laughs> is brought into a different context. That's quite a remarkable. Remarkable tape. Yeah, it is. It's really beautiful. Well, I think we have another clip of uh, Larry okay. Daves. Yes, so this is Larry okay, Daves, who I talked about earlier, and this is that big march through Nacogdoches. It's really, you know, not enough to, uh, to shut down the old order. You have to also create the structures, you know, uh, you know through which people can, can build their own new world. You know, you can't create a new world for people. Uh, people have to be engaged in the, the, the process of, uh, of, of, of building the world that they can then deal with, you know what I mean, and that they can then affect, you know, in a positive way.
I think the combination of a civil rights campaign and a militant union campaign was extremely successful. I thought that was more, but... <laughs> <laughs> but that gives us a good idea of what we'll be wa watching yeah. on Friday night. Right. Yeah. Yeah, please come. Okay. <laughs> now, let's go jump now to some San Antonio stuff. I, I, I've really enjoyed this collection of first jobs, so uh, yeah. let's, let's see a couple of more of those. Yeah, okay. My first job was at Subway. I was 18, which seems a little late to be getting a first job, but that was because I wasn't allowed to work when I was doing high school because my parents wanted me to focus on education. Um, it was seasonal because I thought that would be a good idea midway through college to start getting work experience. And it was a good job. I liked it. It was easy. There's nothing too difficult about it. And I was even asked on to stay past um, the season, but I didn't feel like I would be able to, because I never had before, handle school and work, so I ended up just leaving after the season was done. My first paying job was with a Jewish store entrepreneur in Luling, Texas, and um, I worked four hours on Saturdays doing lighthouse work. I was 17 years old. I was 14 years old and I worked for the National Department store for William Sinken. I was just a sales lady anywhere around. I went from there to Mr. Mazur um, down the street because he paid 20 cents, 25 cents more. And then I went to SolarServe with Mr. Brennan uh, and I worked there about two years. I was started on the floor and then went on as cashier and stayed on as a bookkeeper for a while. My first job was when I was 17. It was a half-day work program from school. And uh, it was at a place called Rogers Import Service. And basically, he was a mechanic for uh, foreign cars. And I was the bookkeeper, uh, answering phones, secretary, and I would write up all the bills. My first job was picking cotton with my grandfather in Seguin, Texas. Uh, first paying job where I received a check each week and uh, it was a very difficult job at 12 years of age but once I got my social security number they took the taxes out from 1965. My first job was in India like I was uh, 22 years old and I have a interview in a one company they call Choxy Tube. They making a stainless steel tubes and I have a job over there to be a like a typist. So I was doing all the typing work and making all the statement. And I work over there at least three to four years. My first job was in sales in a photography studio, uh, Bel Air Studios downtown, I think on Maine. I would develop the film and uh, sell pictures to the soldiers. I was 17. Uh, it was at 67, right after graduation. I loved the job. It was it's nice, something different. Uh, my dad, uh, where he worked at, they had a warehouse and they needed to paint the walls of the warehouse. So my job was to help my dad. I was about this tall. And uh, we got about halfway through. He was using a uh, spray gun. So the place was full of paint particulates and everything in there. Well, the next thing you know, I'm over there all buzzed and everything. He tells me, okay, go sit down. Are you dizzy? Yes. So I went and sat down and he said, take a red rag, this red rag over here, and put it on your face and that way it'll keep the paint out of your face. Okay, well, I picked it up from the other side and it had been dipped in a paint thinner so I took it, took a hit, and <laughs> passed out. And the next hour, uh, he's over waking me up and everything. And the next thing I'm outside getting fresh air. But that was my first job. Oh, that's great. <laughs> now, uh, we're going to continue collecting these because we're finding out all kinds of stuff about San Antonio with these. So later tonight or next time you come or whenever, 
or shoot yourself as a, uh, with a, as a selfie, but let us know your first job. Uh, it's a really remarkable thing that we're collecting and w you'll figure out a way to use it, I suppose, <laughs> in some project in the future. Okay, we've gone a little over time, but you know, such as, as an interesting conversation. Okay. Uh, you've made a commitment with this film. You've, it's final cut. This is going out to the world. Uh, you've already started a few screenings around the, the right. state and to a few festivals. Right. What's been the reaction? Um, really positive. Um, you know, uh, so we went to Cine Las Americas and won an audience award there. So that was great because I always worry about, you know, films like this being in festivals. It's a, you know, it's not always a great audience, although Cine Las Americas is pretty good. Um, and then we're, we're going to um, Edinburgh um, in the Valley um, this Friday after the screening here. Um, we'll be screening it at, on Saturday down there at the South Texas International Festival. So that'll be really great, I think, to get it out to folks in the Valley. And, you know, we're gradually, it's a slow moving film, but I think it's going to reach a lot of people in Texas before we're done. One of the things that's changed from when you and I were in high school mm -hmm. and moving into our, our careers, in mine in sound and, and yours in film, uh, we didn't have a lot of mentorship and a lot of training when we left high school. Right. But today, with the media schools in place and the many media schools here in San Antonio and Urban 15's involvement with youth media, kids are starting out at an earlier age with the capacity to document and make an impact. Mm -hmm. So what advice do you have for the 16 or 17 year old that just might be watching tonight and wants to work in media and tell the story of today? I think, um, you know, one thing that I'm really fascinated by with, with, with young people is I think they should also be documenting young people. I would really like, you know, I, I like the idea of young people going to talk with their elders, but I also like the idea of them looking at each other and trying to figure out how they're understanding the world. Um, so I wouldn't confine the subject matter very much. I, I know that you know, the kinds of issues that are confronting young people today are really serious. Um, you know, I, I want to know what young people are thinking about the environment or what young people are thinking about getting a job. I mean, these young people here are great, right? So I think that there's, there's that ability to just get out there and not just uh, do interviews either. Um, you know, begin filming what's going on around them. You know, if it's a protest or if it's, um, you know, uh, just life around them. I did a film on women that work in fast food restaurants. And, you know, it was great just watching people work. Um, that was, for me, the heart of the film was getting in there and, and getting access. And that's something that young people have the ability to do sometimes, is get in there and get access and document what's going on. Is every moment a part of history? Absolutely. Yeah, yeah it is the moment you say it, right? The moment you say it, yeah. <laughs> Well, look, I'm blown away. Thank you very much for being with Hidden Histories tonight. and. Uh, uh, we hope that we are able to work with you in the future. And who knows when this becomes a movie house, you know, we can That's do the end of this film festival. <laughs> that would be quite wonderful. Oh, uh, this is wonderful. And, okay, well, thank you very much. Uh, in, in closing, I'd like to thank uh, the San Antonio Area Foundation, Santicos Foundation, in particular, San Antonio Film Commission, who've made this very, very uh, a possible that we can do these kind of things and we have the technology to talk and present with anybody who has a computer in the entire world and internet access and this is this has been a lot of fun a special thanks tonight to uh, our board of directors our staff uh, all of the people who make this organization run and particularly 
the supporters of, from all over the world. And we get emails and letters and phone calls thanking us for, for the project we're doing. So good night. Thank you. Uh, uh, appreciate your help. Uh, I don't know which camera is on, but it, all cameras are good. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Ann. Okay, Thank good you night. Thank you very much.